So a lot of people in this room organize grassroots projects in New York City, which is really exciting. And um, I started proposing this to the trade school group because I thought that we could also learn from anthropologists and sociologists to put our work into a broader context. So the statement that moves me is this one, action without reflection is blind, and reflection without action is impotent. So if we only experiment with these grassroots economic projects and don't think about what motivates us to do this and understand larger structures that make this action necessary, it will, might be slightly blind. And if we only reflect and read and uh, embed ourselves in theory or academia, we might not actually understand the power of experiential knowledge. So this is an attempt to acknowledge that you guys are all doing really exciting experiments and also to bring in voices that aren't always heard in the arts. So tonight we have Stephen Gudeman, but before I introduce him, I thought I would just talk about the groups that made this possible. I don't know, how can you go to the next slide? Thank you. Okay, so one group is No Longer Empty. Um, they have a show right now called How Much Do I Owe You? It's in Long Island City, and uh, a bunch of artists are exploring uh, economics from a variety of perspectives, so they've helped us out a lot. Next slide. And also Our Goods, this is a barter network that connects artists and activists and farmers to trade skills and spaces and objects without money. Also, Trade School, I'm a member of Trade School. It's a self-organized learning platform that runs on barter, so anyone can teach a class, and you have to ask for things besides money from your students, so services or food, all kinds of things. That's what Jake was referring to earlier. And then, Lastly, there's a larger umbrella group called Solidarity NYC, and Solidarity NYC's goal is to connect all of the grassroots efforts around economic justice in New York City so that it's not just barter networks, not in cooperation with time banks or community currencies, but recognizing that all of these efforts need to mobilize together because they share values of democracy and sustainability. So in that vein, I thought it would be good to recognize our sister ally project, Time Banks NYC. We have Jessie Riley here, and she's going to tell you a little bit about time banking. You can go to the next slide. Sing along. I said money, money changes everything. You think you know what you're doing? That don't mean a thing. It's all in the past now. Money changes everything. Do, 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 do. Alright, here's the timing. in time, an hour for an hour, skills and services without a dime. If you have an iPhone or just a pen, <laughs> write down this web address, nyc.gov, time makes NYC. Um, for more information, I'll give it to you after the talk. If you have any questions, I will be waiting after the talk. Thank you. Wow. Yes, Jesse Riley is amazing. <laughs> um, okay, so this is a series of talks. Um, first, we had Keith Hart 
who talked two months ago about the relationship of government and state infrastructure to alternative economies. And then uh, last month, we had Mary Beth Radden, who talked about the educational potential of community currencies. Now we have Steve Gudeman talking about community-based measures of value. And in the following month, in February, we're having Jason Pine, who will talk about the way that people perform economies in relationship to their identity. And he's going to give a performance lecture. So now we can finally hear the talk. But I thought you should know that Steve Gudeman is a professor of anthropology at the University of Minnesota. He's carried out field work in rural Panama, Colombia, Guatemala, and Cuba. Recently, through the Max Planck Institute in Germany, he's overseen a comparative study of economy and ritual in six Eastern European and Asian countries. His primary interest is in local or cultural models of economy, a topic that includes anthropological settings as well as developed market economies and their theories. He has published six books, edited several others, had one book written about his work and authored numerous articles. And what's been really moving about his work for me is this idea of a home economy and the idea that your goal is not to accumulate as much wealth as possible but to expand a base so that there isn't one measure of value but that your goal could be to build a community and to share your wealth as much as possible in that group. So he's going to talk about that, and I'm really glad that he was able to make it today. Thanks. Good. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, hope to have the chance to meet some of you. Um, I'm going to talk mostly uh, right from what I've written down. Um, and, but it's m more written in the idea of trying, it's not totally sort of smooth narrative, kind of coherent, but I hope to trigger off at least some thoughts, and I will certainly try to entertain any questions you have at the end. A lot of it is kind of punctuated. It isn't, you know, explained in four books. That would be too much for here. Uh, the title of my talk, yeah, is Measure for Measure. I have studied how, what I call house economies, and I can develop that later, but I'm not going to talk about it here, but not in great detail. I have studied house economies in Panama, Colombia, and post-socialist Eastern Europe. These economies are not organized as markets, but in a very different way, um, though today all are connected to markets. House economies provide a counterpoint and different forms of resistance to our normal economics, uh, to our normal economic practices in normal economics. Over time, this work has led me to develop a distinctive view of economy. Um, for house economies also are found embedded in our market economy. They provide a mirror on what we do. This work has taken me in many, many directions, uh, but much of it revolves about ways of making do, uh, different measurement systems, creativity, other forms of exchange, different values, and even art. So I'm going to touch on some of those, but none of them as complete as necessary. Before considering some of these issues, I want to start with three vignettes about house practices that we all have experienced. Uh, as I proceed, you may wish to consider similar ones in your own lives. So this first part I'll call connecting to the past. And I call this the Curtis event. Sixty-five years ago, my grandmother had a house in Tempe, Arizona, where she knew artists in the area. Phil Curtis uh, later became known as a surrealist, and she helped him. Uh, he was n having a hard time. She helped him, and when my father uh, was visiting, he gave Curtis three Western shirts. I mean, he needed the shirts. Later, Curtis gave my parents a three-and-a-half by four-and-a-half framed picture of three dancing Western shirts with cacti in the background. 
My parents kept it. I didn't see it that much. Um, and, you know, it's just a small place. And then after they died, I got it, and I keep it in our bedroom. Um, it must have been the anthropologist and art appreciator in me, as I now realize this event was very anthropological. First, it was a gift exchange or reciprocity. My father, who was generous, uh, he was a businessman, did not offer the shirts to receive anything from Curtis, but Curtis responded with a gift of, <coughs> uh, with a gift of the shirts in the painting. Second, the exchange was between a purchased commodity, by which I mean something in the market, goods and services, that was turned from the commercial world of value in the market to the house domain and given between people. So there was a movement from one world to the other or I sometimes call these different circuits of value. Third, the returned art for me became part of a family legacy of value. It symbolized my father's sharing, and it had been held in the family. Its value to me is this legacy, or sometimes they use the word base, that is outside monetary value. I will never sell it. Incidentally, when I, I wrote that, and I thought, I don't know if any of you have ever seen Antiques Roadshow. I really like to watch that because people come to get appraised their old antiques, and then if it's worth a lot, they say, oh, I'll never sell it. You know, it's part of my family. Well, that epitomizes this double kind of, double kind of valuation. Fourth, I would not classify the exchange between my father and Curtis as barter, which is a direct exchange of goods without money. Its value to me is this legacy, uh, sorry, it, 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 uh, it, it's, uh, I would not classify it as barter. Uh, this one was delayed, which can be characteristic of reciprocity. And it was not calculated or exactly measured, or to, to use the word, it wasn't commensurated. The return from Curtis was an emblem of his identity as an artist, and he was giving more than just his labor. And uh, I don't know how long it took him to make it. Finally, we're dealing here then with incommensurate or incomparable values. Economists would bring this to a bottom line by saying we can put monetary values on everything and looking at it as a balance or imbalance of monetary values. I think we calculate, we do calculate that, but because we get habituated or accustomed to it by the market. I don't think it's necessarily perfectly within us. Traditionally, however, many, many economists have worked in this other kind of way that I've just described, especially the ones anthropologists study. Um, I have two other, two other small short vignettes, which I'll give you just to sort of keep us going here. Um, this one I call my grandmother's book. When I was in high school, my grandmother lent me a book by Herbert Yardley, probably never heard of him. Uh, it's called The American Black Chamber. And I was in high school. It's about a, a code-breaking agency in the US that began after the First World War. I loved the book and returned it to her. And before her death, uh, she gave it to me. And it's, it, too, sits on a bookshelf. I remember the joy in the reading, my surprise that she owned it and had read it, and at her memory that I, one of 13 grandchildren, would appreciate it. It's a, different it's a different legacy of value that in a small way has helped to shape my identity, and I keep it for what it symbolizes. This material object helped make or mediate a relationship with my grandmother outside any kind of market exchange, just like the Curtis picture was. And then thirdly, I'll give you one more. My father, I call it my father's lost book. About 10 years before his death, my father had a bookseller track down John Maynard Keynes's book, Indian Currency. He had read it, my father had read it and admired it years before. It was published in 1913, and my father must have read it in the 1920s, I don't know. After he died, Someone was in my mother's house and took it and never returned it. I would have liked to have owned it for what it represented about my father, what interested him, his, re his reaching back to an early book, and his pleasure in obtaining it. 
I, of course, could buy another copy of it, find it somewhere, but that would never be the same thing. So here was a, a legacy loss, so to speak. These are small, outside-the-market vignettes of experiences that we all have. They fall outside the gaze of economists, and they do not come to consciousness among most of us because we are so culturally imbued with market thinking, rational thought, and making a profit. Now, I want to turn now to what I call the house model. I don't go into this in great detail, but I see basically I don't think the world is just made up of markets. And from my anthropology in Latin America and Eastern Europe, I think they're really two interlocked models uh, actually dialectically related, the house and the market or the house and the corporation. So I want to tell you briefly what I mean by the house model because it does relate to these issues. So my examples exemplify many features of what I mean by the house model of economy, which is always in interaction with the market. The house has a base or holding of disparate, incommensurate things, which can provide, at least in Latin America, material support. I do not call it capital, because that refers to money. And it provides an identity of what you have built. It is not out of time. Pe people connect their base to the past. A house economy, secondly, has a tendency to aim for self-sufficiency by producing what it needs and consuming what it has. Of course, it's never completely independent and trades with other houses or on the market. So I'm just building a model to help us think about it. The house also must be thrifty or economize with its means versus trying to make a profit, which is the province of business in the market. When a house engages in trade with other houses, it's more like barter or is reciprocity, which I've already mentioned. Inside the house, goods are shared, which does not mean they are distributed equally. You can share unequally, too. Houses are not filled, however, with contracts like markets, although I have a variety of cartoons, mostly from the New Yorker, about parents making contracts with their children. But in the more extreme case, it's a matter of sharing, and it can be very unequal. The <coughs> one issue concerns these exchanges in the house. How are they measured? What happens when the house engages in market exchange as well? And it's a really fascinating topic, which I've looked at in many different places. The house economy, generalizing very broadly, lies in the incommensurate sphere of economy. So let's put the house model to work. Now, I said here, but I don't think many of you or any of you have seen it, so I'm going to have to summarize it quickly. And uh, um, uh, 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 a piece about house economies in particularly where I've studied in Panama and Colombia. It's, this piece circles about the idea of strength, uh, which would probably be the best translation from the Spanish, or it could also be thought of, it's, it circles about the idea of life's vitality. People expend, and now I'm talking about the kind of their language, their discourse for this. People expend their strength, gaining a living from agriculture. Uh, in, farming, uh, in farming, they compose, I'm going to come back to that word quite a bit, they compose water, soil, sun, and wind to have a crop. They do not speak of producing so much as composing or putting something together. In this sense, their work is rather like a piece of art. Of course, they have established ways of doing it, but their words do not evoke a mechanical process or a kind of technology, the outcome and ways of doing change and are uncertain. People take pride not only in the product that they eat, um, uh, not only in the product that they eat, but how a field looks, how well it is weeded, and how thrifty they have been in the doing. None of it adds up to a single number. Uh, maybe you could show the next slide. I'll just do it once. This is, um, that's rice. In, from Panama, in this case, that's rice from a field hanging from rafters and drying 
uh, and eventually it will be it will be processed at the house. Um, now, so I've talked about about strength. Um, when people <coughs> raise, what people raise in the fields, particularly rice in this case, contains strength, as they use, say they use the word, for living, and they get strength from the food grown. So people have strength, expend it working on objects which then embodies their strength and provides them with strength. Similarly, if you work for others outside the house, then your strength is contained in their food, and in reverse, if they work for you, their strength is in your food. So think of the base, that word I've used, think of the base of a house is made up of strength, which is embodied in everything of the house, the food stored, tools kept, the physical house. The base contains strength, and this strength comes from the people of the house, which is one meaning of house self-sufficiency. But it also comes from others. So people are, are connected by the strength that they've shared in their work. And that's their word, strength, la fuerza. Um, and it's a physical, it's obviously an idea. When people exchange labor, they sometimes say that they're exchanging, and there are a lot of different wonderful expressions. These are from Colombia. They exchange back for back. I mean, one, wonderful kind of metaphors, images, rib for rib, the exchange, arm for arm. It depends on the area where you're talking to them, which is a lively figure for what they do. But the general term for all these expressions is strength for strength. Some of your strength is in me, and some of my strength is in you when we eat. We are not isolates, <coughs> as in the market, uh, but are made up of others, much as my grandmother's book is in me and is part of what I am. Can we extend this Latin American example to art? For example, strength is composed like a work of art, which is not a mechanical act. Being thrifty in the house is the art of making do, of putting this to that use such as making a meal of leftovers or using a plastic sheet that was discarded in the market as a raincoat. More subtly, strength connects people through the sharing of food and work. I put something of my strength in you and you in me. The more we do it, the more we are connected. Consider a piece of art, whether a standard painting, something we devise, something we drew, or the way we make a dwelling. These doings have an impact on people who are influenced by it and, are the, and see the world a little differently. They may stimulate new thoughts, and the object may be copied or adapted. It connects one person to another and then to others. The artist, through her work, reaches someone else. In this sense, art is like Moses' gift that connects people. It's like it, the Curtis painting my grandmother's book, and countless other things. I'm going to return to this, art, uh, to this idea of creativity and innovation as affecting others in a moment, but first let's take, let's take this in a slightly different direction on commensuration. The world changes when strength, art, grandmother's books, and more come into the market. What happens to art when it is paid for as opposed to being a way of linking people? I do pay to go into a museum, but it is not art as a gift, a form of resistance, as you know, to market exchange, just as a house economy can be a mode of resistance or a retraction from the market. When house products enter the market, they become commodities, to use the, the big time term, they become commodities separate from their makers not only commoditized and disentangled from people, relationships, they are made commensurate with other objects through the measuring rod of money. Money seeps into all spheres of economy, and it involves commensuration. I encountered this commensuration process in fieldwork where it puzzled me. Commensuration means bringing to a common measuring rod. Two of our common measuring rods are the meter or yardstick and the dollar. In fieldwork, I found many disparate measures um, 
And I can quickly show you these pictures, although I understand there's some objections. If you would go to the next slide. Um, there I am in the Walker Art Center garden. Um, and that's one measure that's sometimes known as, translated as a yard. Um, I'll come back to that in a sec. If you want to show the next one. And two arms out is another way of measuring, which I'll come back to. And there I'm using one of many kind of baskets to carry seed to seed. It's a fine grass that they have. Um, yeah, they have a, a, a sculpture garden. Uh, go, go to, let's go to the next one. This is um, a simulation. It should be those rice stalks, but I didn't have any in, 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 in uh, there. And so I bought some corn at the farmer's market and that's, that would be called a handful. And uh, a handful of rice stalks is one measure. Uh, oh, that would, well, maybe that would be a fistful. A fistful is one measure. A handful is much larger. Uh, would you go to the large next one? That would be one of many carrying baskets that people use to measure. They're all different sizes, but it would be known as a basketful. And let's see, there's another one somewhere. Yeah. That just shows you where it hangs. And um, let's see, is there one more? Oh, yeah, that's, that's uh, uh, a room full of newspapers at the door. <laughs> anyway, OK. Um, so I collected all these different kind of measures, and those were just a few samples of, of what I had. Um, and I won't go back into them, but there are, there are a lot of them. They're homemade measures, hands, arms, Paces. I've got uh, you know pictures of people pacing off a field, uh, so that and none of them are convertible one to the other. Now my interest in this diversity of measures was stimulated on realizing that the home consumption crops such as rice and maize, and the market or cash crops, which in this case was sugarcane, are measured very differently. One afternoon in Panama, a neighbor was telling me about his work and harvests in rice and in sugarcane. For the rice, he used the diverse measures, some of which you've seen, ranging from the number of calabashes used uh, in seeding to the number of paces around the field. They disappeared when we talked about the sugarcane, which was sold to mills and measured in money. Seed work, harvest, and other expenses were all expressed in financial terms, or sums. For years, I was puzzled by this shift until I realized that I was observing the impact of markets and an early stage in the commensuration process. My field observations are not new. This perplexing issue of how to convert diverse qualities to a quantity has a long history in economics. Aristotle first posed the topic when he observed that a shoe has two uses. I won't take mine off to show you, but you can see, uh, like all of us, we have shoes, most of us. Um, we can appreciate its qualities of the shoe as an article of clothing, and we can exchange it for something else, such as food or a book. In one context, we appreciate its use, and in the other, we appreciate what it brings in exchange. Aristotle tried to work out a theory of value in exchange but even if he was clear about the difference between use value and exchange value, his theory of exchange value was a muddle. 2,000 years later, Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations set out his famous paradox, at least amongst economists. Water, he observed, is the most useful item we know, but it has no exchange value. That's when he was writing over 200 years ago. <laughs> Not now. Um, diamonds, he said, have little use value, although some of us display them, but they command a high value in exchange. Like Aristotle, Adam Smith never resolved how to put the two sides of value together. The Aristotelian distinction was, was used to great effect by Marx when he contrasted the use value and the exchange value of labor and showed how capitalists deploy the difference to extract a surplus from laborers. The capitalist, in this case, pays for the worker's exchange value, or 
what he needs for his maintenance, but receives his use value or labor time, which can produce more than the exchange value of his labor that he uses. The capitalist appropriates the surplus. Marx's distinction helped to inspire political revolutions, especially in the 20th century, obviously, but he assumed that labor is the common measuring rod back to commensuration of all value. His theory did not work on logical grounds, fell to one side when market economies expanded, and disappeared in standard economics with the turn to what's called marginal economics in the late 19th century. After the marginalist revolution by economists, value, and this part of what really interests me, value and price in economics become synonymous. Price is determined by the intersection of demand and supply, and there are other technicalities about it, and that's, and uh, that is so that the value of a good is its price in markets and in normal standard economics. So that the old expression of value in use from Aristotle, now uh, actually that became utility, and um, then it turned to the idea, it became the idea of consumer preference. The marginalist treatment of price, trade, and markets has proved to be useful in, pres in prescribing how decisions should be made, in analyzing decisions that were made, and in describing some markets. But it comes with heroic assumptions. The subjective conversion of quality to quantity. Each person in this, is in, in, in this theory, which is, which is the prevailing theory now, each person transforms a collection, a heterogeneous collection of qualities, such as the color, size, style, comfort, as well as history and memories of a shoe, to a quantity, um, which is assessed by a number, first, second, third, or one, two, three. The shoe is no longer a piece of leather, plastic, or rubber. No longer is it finely or poorly designed. It is no longer comfortable or ill-fitting. No longer has it a thick or thin sole or a connection to who made it and used it and gave it. A family heirloom, such as a painting or a book, may be valued, but this feature, because it's part of the family, is included within a summary in comparative number, hence Antiques Roadshow. Many of us do compare an ice cream cone with its many flavors to a cigar that has different tastes to a sip of Merlot with its complete char complex character. Even if the ice cream, the cigar, and the wine cost the same, our consumption qu capacity is limited, so we rank and choose which to eat first. But sometimes, and this is what also intrigues me, but sometimes we feel remorse, not at the choice, but having to make the comparison, making commensurate. The ice cream is tasty. The cigar eases tension, and the Merlot brings a happier heart, but we feel conflicted, conflicted about comparing incommensurate values or tastes. Orthodox economists assume this transformation of quality to quantity is normal because rational choice reveals that people do it, and you do it in the market all the time. Now, th this transformation of qualities to a quantity is a process of abstraction that runs through all spheres of economy. And it involves commensuration, obviously. In the house that I've discussed, we abstract from incommensurate, um, we, we abstract from incommensurate people and things to a variety of measures, local measures, such as I was showing up here, paces, gourds, sacks, and so forth, but that's one step of abstraction. In the commercial domain, goods and services that we sell, we abstract from diverse qualities to ranking them and to a price, as also described. Then in the financial sphere, which New York knows very well, units of a measure are abstracted to their relations, such as an interest rate, which relates this and that over time with the interest rate at different times. And then finally, what I like to call the metafinancial sphere, which New York really knows, Wall Street, abstraction occurs 
when moving from a fixed rate of exchange to its rate of, cha of change, which is what derivatives do. We don't need to go into that. But what I'm su suggesting is that the market spheres of economy are increasingly based on abstraction in the service of commensuration. The sphere of finance, for example, is more impersonal and content-free than the house economy that has a material and face-to-face -face presence. Abstracting and commensuration can provide generalities, as in mathematical formula, and also a kind of centralization and control and power. Abstracting can bring efficiency, as in the case of arbitrage and downsizing, but we also always get power. The person who effectively abstracts and can commensurate is known often to anthropologists as homo economicus, or the rational chooser. Above all, commensuration has to do with market trade and making a profit. Now, uh, I'm going to shift now a little bit, but not that much. I want to talk about innovation as art. This part of my narrative will perhaps be less familiar to you. I start by talking about the idea of profit in markets. Actually, profit is a bit mysterious. Of course, we know about profit, and it is made by selling goods, by suppressing the wage, by sequestering money as in finance, and there are lots of ways of doing this, such as you know, selling subprime mortgages. We charge interest on a loan, and there are many ways of doing this for profit, and which we all sense even if we cannot fully explain it. But these ways of profiting do not address my question, which is how does profit start? What makes it? The ways of making a profit that I have mentioned are ways of getting hold of profit in the system, so to speak. The extra value is already there and is simply being shifted from one person to another. What is its inception? About 100 years ago, the economist Joseph Schumpeter developed the idea of innovation as creating profit. Broadly, innovation means putting together something new to which people are attracted. Innovation means making a new combination, finding a different way of making something, using a new resource, finding a more effective way of making the old. These are new combinations. I find it interesting that while economists highly respect Schumpeter, and he had some ugly parts, his idea does not really filter into economics or regular, is regularly taught, perhaps because it makes a market economy discontinuous or punctuated. It upsets the idea of a system, such as prices, that reaches equilibrium. Innovations are unpredictable although corporations spend much effort trying to capture them. What intrigues me is the process of innovation and how it depends not on rational, linear thinking, but on what I call figurative reason, which is very characteristic of house economies. For example, some years ago, I was in Lowell, Massachusetts, which is where textile manufacturing really took off in the 19th century. Lowell is located near waterfalls, which uh, could be harnessed for power to run the looms in the factories. Lowell is now practically a museum about this past. During my visit, I was able to see how the energy of a waterfall before the use of, of electricity was transferred from the falling water to the factories. They used big belts that were powered by turbines at the base of the waterfall, turned the big belts, um, and then ran the belts to the factories, which then turned the looms in the factories. So there's big belts going around like this. The belts were in a vertical position. And on seeing them, I realized that they were what we now call conveyor belts. Shift now to Henry Ford and his innovation of mass manufacturing with specialization. Uh, by moving parts on a conveyor belt, instead of like this, like this, <coughs> by moving parts on a conveyor belt, um, uh, uh, each worker could specialize on a task. You start here, add, 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 and a car ends up at the far end 
uh, in Michigan. What intellectual operation was involved? I suggest that Ford took the idea of a belt that transferred energy, flopped it 90 degrees to the horizontal direction, and used it as a conveyor belt inside his factory. I'm picturing what might have happened, but it makes my point that innovations result from the imagination, from figurative reason, from seeing something differently um, and putting something to use in a different way. They are works of art in that sense. Let me press the issue or the idea further. If innovations create profit through art, then at the center of market economy that is putatively an expression of rational thinking lies the unpredictable process of art. Economic growth depends on the artistic imagination. Think Steve Jobs. I go too far, perhaps, with this suggestion, but now return to the way a house operates in Latin America, to the way people invent recipes and cooking styles, to how they invent measuring rods, to how we all make do with what we have by using a piece of this to repair that. I could offer many other examples from Latin America of art in ordinary commercial products. But I close by asking <coughs> whether we are all artists all the time in our everyday lives. Could we say that we live by art, that art links us, and that art is the foundation of our material life? There you are. So I had mentioned that those um, photographs made me slightly uncomfortable, and I thought we could start by talking about that because um, I realized that in your terms, what makes me uncomfortable about the photographs of you wearing um, garments that aren't from your culture is the idea that you're talking about with the legacy and the base, so that potentially you're acquiring um, objects of significance to a community that you're not um, part of. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering how you came to obtain them and how you feel about um, representing that culture in photographs. Um, I don't feel as bad as you may think I should feel. Uh, I think that shirt, uh, it's about the second I got that 30, 35 years ago or more. It was given to me um, and um, by someone in the village and it, who, had, who had made it. Um, and um, I've only worn it maybe twice. I put it on, I mean, there I was in Minneapolis, as I mentioned, that was in the Walker Art Center, you know, sculpture garden. So I was trying to simulate something and I put it on to give some kind of sense. I collected things like that, those baskets and so forth, not of anthropological interest. Now, um, I mean, I, entire, I could tell a story, well, I'll tell this story, um, which may fit with what, what you're talking about. Uh, at that time when I did the field work, I remember there was a village on the southern coast of, of Panama, fairly large, it was holding a big fiesta. And a number of the people of our village were going there, so I went and went along. And uh, it was quite large. It's one of these things that lasted all day. And pretty soon, there was a man on a great big horse came in, which, I mean, nobody had a horse. and you know, We were on foot and everything else. And I, didn't, I was not wearing anything like that. And uh, he had on one of these kind of white guayaberas, they're called, uh, very hand-sewn hand, hand white shirt fancy. And I thought, oh my goodness, you know, this is kind of a, a big ascendado. This is a very important wealthy person because up on the horse and kind of stumbling over everybody and looking down. So I asked someone, who is that? And uh, well, what do you know? He was the ex-governor of Wisconsin who was head of AID in Panama. Now, that offended me a lot. And I've never forgotten that kind of image. I don't have a picture of him, but I agree. That kind of, of, of false thing. Now, a different part I know of your, of your question is, um, or the broader aspect is, how, what do you do as an anthropologist? How do you repay people? How do you interact with them? What do you do? My work in Panama, my wife was there, and um, I would directly pay informants, as we would call them, these people, 
who would work with me because I was taking them out of a day of labor in the field. I absolutely had to. I uh, then went to Colombia, and that's a long story, but it was actually quite interesting. I wanted to go to Colombia because Panama had been part of Colombia and had been broken off from Colombia under the influence of the U.S. after the turn of the last century because we wanted to build a canal. Okay, similar cultures, but also somewhat different, so I wanted to work there. Uh, when I first went down there, I had to talk to, because he controlled it, the head of the anthropology agency there, a government, a government arm, and uh, he explained to me that if I wanted to work in Colombia and do field work, I had to make over 30% of my uh, whatever funds they were, because that's what a university in the United States would collect if I had external funds coming in. That was the number at that point. National Science Foundation, 30% would go to the university. Well, anthropologists aren't that rich, and I didn't, I didn't have any of those kind of funds, and no agency would ever fund me. I was sympathetic, though, with what he was saying. Later, he got thrown out uh, because he fiddled some of those funds and got an airplane and so forth. Um, but then I, one of my students was doing fieldwork in Colombia, finished his PhD, and we said, well, let's do some fieldwork together in Colombia. And we started out, and he was going to do one village maybe, and I, and I would do another. And I was supporting him completely financially uh, for the fieldwork. Um, and then it turned out we started doing joint fieldwork together. Uh, which was absolutely fascinating. I think maybe you've got some of the description of it. And then we published together, um, and it was, it was really joint work. And that was a different and new experience for me. After we finished, he, of all things, then became head of the anthropology agency in Colombia. He left after a while because of political fights, uh, you know, with politicos there. Um, but it was a benefit to both of us. We both got something out of it, and I felt very good about it because I was, in that kind of sense, um, giving back, I think, to the country where I was working. I would say the other thing is when we went around and people in Colombia, and it took me a while to figure out what, what to say. People would, you know, in the field, I mean, we're talking about what we would call peasants or campesinos, would ask us, why are you doing this? And um, can you help us? And I found the straight answer, it suddenly kind of came across to me, which is, I'm, I'm not bringing aid to you. What I'm going to do is try to learn about your culture and teach it and write about it, you know, back in my country and elsewhere, so that people know how you live and what's important to you. And interestingly enough, that really went down well because these people are, you know, up till now, who cares about them? And here was someone interested, and my, my colleague and I were interested in them, wanted to write about them, and that's exactly what we did. And uh, that was really the true answer. And so for me, that's always served as, a, as an important kind of reflection about the nature of field work and what we're doing. Very few anthropologists, you know, make much money out of writing books or something. Uh, we don't get invited into the U.S. government. Um, not too many co corporations, at least at that time, valued our work. Uh, but it was true. We were truly trying to educate and spread the word about what we were seeing. So those are kind of my responses to the way I responded to some of this. And uh, it's complicated, I agree. Maybe other people have other ideas. Are there other questions? Uh, not so much a question at this point, but a set of empathy. I was studying conflict in, uh, I'm not an anthropologist, more psychology, social psychology, um, animal behavior actually, but <coughs> studying people's behavior in a uh, village in the Niger Delta and I mostly doing community development. My husband was a community developer and um, uh, as part of my study, I was asking people's uh, attitudes and feelings about the oil company because that's a real problem in that area. Now, I had to get permission uh, from my university back here because I was interviewing people and asking questions. I'm forgetting the name of the proper committee at this point. And um, I was supposed to do everything anonymously. Right. And I tried to explain right. to them that <laughs> the people were so proud 
that they were being asked, yeah. that they did not want to be a number, they did not want their name yeah. crossed off. They yeah. loved the idea that someone was going to read what they thought and said, so yes. And, and, but to convey that cultural difference yeah. can be difficult. Um, uh, let me just quickly, should I try to, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, everything I write, I try to, though, make the names anonymous because you never want to put anybody in danger. And I won't say anything more than that, at least right now. The other part of it that fascinates me is I mentioned sugarcane in Panama. You know, the, I got into the mills, got into the hierarchy, but oh my, I, there's a lot of things that I had to swear I would never reveal that seemed to me so that the people in power corporations have much more control on the discourse, and that's happened to me in the United States, than the people anthropologists go to. We do have a code of ethics, and the universities have their codes too, but there still is that power asymmetry that I think you're suggesting. Let's see, there was one over there. Huh. Is it on? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Awesome. Um, thanks for the talk. That was really neat. I'd not, I'd never heard of what you said put together quite like that. So it was kind of amazing. Um, I think what I'm hearing from your talk and then the issues that have been raised here is um, how do you orchestrate different systems of valuation, whether you call them home or base, yeah. or market price driven, whether right. it's currency that you can put in your wallet or in your memory, <laughs> whether it drives your internal narrative, your personal history, like the cactus shirt painting and that lost book and the basset yeah. hound with the papers, or uh, whether it, it functions as a PhD dissertation <laughs> Uh, that lends yeah. you a nice job. Um, so I think that like this is really interesting right now at this time in right. our country because mm. there is this idea of let's not just have a marketplace that's made up of one thing like the Keynesian economy. Let's have a multivariate marketplace based in trade, barter, whatever, ponies, yeah. doesn't really matter. How do we then come to a place D or do we even need to come to this place of a common denominator? Do we, do we really need to have a system that houses all these valuations in such a fashion where we can say two ponies equals one basset hound equals half a piece of newspaper? Do you see what do you, do you Oh, yeah. Okay, that's, good. Can you answer uh, that question? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a yeah, marvelous, well, this would take four or five hours, but that's a terrific... That's a terrific question. Here's the way I look at it, and um, I don't know that, well, to some degree others agree or not. I think of, and it was mentioned here briefly, this long answer, short, short version. I think economy is disparate. I mean, I see it in terms of, call it spheres, spheres of value, call it institutions. The house, commerce, which is corporations, finance, banks, and so forth, and, and, um, and metafinance, which is the world of derivatives. Now, I also think that once you're in the market, with all the competition, remember the market is, I use the word sharing versus competition, it's they mix together. I think both sides are what I would call dialectically related. One sometimes covers up the other, the other covers up one. Sometimes we're doing this and it's really we're doing that and we play this game all the time. If I look at a work of art, I may look to appreciate it, but I also may use it in a competitive way to show other people up. So their actions are often ambiguous. Now, in the market, I think with competition, we are competing. I am fairly hard line on this, more hard line than a lot of people would like. We compete for profit. And one of the things that we've seen, we see it in the great crisis, is that it, it either colonizes and other domains, in other words, the market colonizes the house. Uh, so that you do get these jokes about, well, how much is it worth to me to pay my, gra to pay my children's education and will they get paid back? That's market kind of thinking, and people do that. I don't think that's necessarily natural. I think that that's 
cultural in the sense we learn this behavior. Of course, we're rational people, but we also are use figurative reason, and we so that the market begins to dominate. Uh, uh, people use fancy words like hegemony and so forth. I call it colonized. I get colonized by that. I get colonized by the practices in the market. Everything's on sale. And I get colonized, if I can say so, by the theories of economists. So that's part of what resistance to it is about. And where it's all going to go, I don't know. But we do seem to have a few crises every once in a while, whether it's a blowout in the market or whether it's a blowout in the oil fields. This competition for profit is 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 in the United States in particular, uh, you know, in other countries there's more more kind of control on it. So that's what I meant by abstraction and power and colonizing down and increasingly abstract. And um, I may be wrong. I don't think you know. I think we have all these capacities in us as human beings, but it is our market economy is our culture. So that really short answer to your important question. Hi, um, uh, my question uh, concerns, um, you know, you were talking about household economy and how we always seem how markets uh, like colonizes, mm. you know, certain aspects and, you know, like, you know, on the one hand, it's, it's about, um, you know, like personal relations, but then right. sometimes we translate mm. it uh, exactly. into market. Exactly. So I was wondering if you have seen uh, reverse colonizations where households, you know, these like personal relations, you know, colonize, um, right. yeah, a, a commercial sphere. Well, I think, uh, well, two things. First of all, if you think about socialism or communism, um, Che Guevara, uh, who still is this kind of figure you often see on, you know, Cuba and so forth, from, uh, well, actually he wasn't Cuban, but he you know, was obviously with Fidel. Um, he was always a, did a lot of writings on how do you bring together what did he call it you know market incentives in effect with the more socialist ones and he would give lectures to factories about this how do you if you talk to standard economists they'll say the only way to do it is you know to have proper incentives that's so that call that a failed experiment mostly uh, but not necessarily directly for that of course a lot of which we earlier mentioned and what you're doing here are forms of resistance to it, multiple kind of values. How do you do it? Uh, you know, if, if I could write a cookbook, I would. Uh, but I think it's fascinating with um, a lot of the different kind of endeavors that go on, whether it's, you know, farmers or others. It's, it's a tough go. And I think if someone knew how to do it, they could, well, they could make a million dollars writing a book on it. <laughs> <laughs> to mix the values. <laughs> but yeah, true. Yeah. Aren't they kind of already doing that in collaborative consumption? Like Zipcar and Airbnb? Oh, yes. Yeah. So wouldn't that yeah. be um, th I think that's a good point. Then where was something else I saw this in Minneapolis recently and I was thinking about it. Actually, we do it. What One of my mild endeavors would be to try to educate people into this. Think about, I mean, zip cars, yes. Uh, think about museums. Think about the national parks in the US and how Yellowstone and others uh, get commoditized. And so, you know, should we charge a fee for a public museum or should it be open to everybody? And boy, you know, look at the politics on this between the right and the left. I was fascinated by, I'm deviating a little bit from what you're saying, I was fascinated by Obama's remark to Romney, you didn't make that. And about 99.5% of Americans were really offended by that. But my interpretation of, of Obama's remark is that Romney, and I couldn't go into this here, is that innovations, and that was one of my objections to, Sh to Schumpeter, are are not individualistic things. They depend on a community of knowledge and communication. And if you don't maintain that community, and you can define it as education, you can define it as all kinds of stuff, 
then you're not going to have the innovation. So the idea that Romney gets it all, and you can like him or not, the idea that he gets it all because he did it is, from my standpoint, a falsehood. Unfortunately, I think Obama, and I don't know where he got his statement, didn't explain it like we're talking about here. Now, one, therefore, of if it would ever be possible, uh, would be to get people to understand a bit better uh, about how we really depend on others. Now, that's the point about sharing. That's the point about talking about strength. So don't have the answer yet on this, but working toward it. There's one here. Oh. Hi. Um, this is related to the, to the previous question. Um, and so you already said that you don't have the million dollar book ready to go. <laughs> but you might have um, some, I'm curious if you have more specific examples of organized efforts uh, down in Columbia or in any of the other places that you've worked um, to use to use the logic of what you call the, the house economies and, and the, the tool of incommensurability to create some form of more organized resistance. There are, and there are more recent ones, and frankly, I'm not up on them. I'm looking, I've, you know, I've not been doing field work there so much. I'm trying to think of in Eastern Europe, that's even more complicated because they emerged from socialism into a disaster of markets, and we had a team of researchers looking basically at house economies. And many of them, Romania, Hungary, and so forth, are just getting back on their feet. So I've been more directed there. I, you know, I, oh, I've seen this in Colombia, a very, very complicated place with the narcos and so forth. Um, there are foundations trying to foster this kind of thing. Um, it's a tough go. In fact, one of the things I did way back in Panama was there was a very interesting bishop, he later became archbishop, uh, who was trying to give uh, the shield, if you want, uh, the umbrella of, of the church to cooperatives. Well, it was right in the area where I was working and so I was studying that. It's a long, complicated story, but the very notion of a cooperative got co-opted by the president who came in, uh, General Omar Torrijos, and he read some stuff that I had written with others, and then he turned all the private sugarcane mills where I was into a public, a, into a, a government one, but that became a f slight form of, sometimes the word fascism might be used. <laughs> so uh, there the idea was co-opted, and that can happen as well, and they get co-opted. In Colombia, uh, I w again, I, I, w I once studied, because I've always been interested in recycling and reusing out of the house economy, but um, in tires for automobiles uh, get really worn out there. And so there are people who repair them and repair them and repair them, and there's a lot of recycling of them. And uh, I was able to look at, I've never published it, um, the kind of layers of recycling. There was one that I thought it was German equipment, <coughs> that uh, kind of hot press it's called, and actually it was a, a company in Iowa and uh, that had it down there. And you work all the way down, and then there was a cooperative that did it. And they didn't have the, in quotes, capital to buy that kind of, that kind of equipment. They were not as competitive. Their producti you know, productivity wasn't as high. It's really hard, I think, to, and you all know this, it's hard to get that any kind of organized cooperative mentality going when you're in this kind of larger system. That actually, from work in Cuba, I began to understand better why so much of what could be marketable stuff for profit in Cuba, and this was about eight years ago that I did that, uh, has been kept out because once you take that line, for whatever reason, uh, the profit motive comes in. Now, some people say, well, that's natural. Don't fight human nature. Um, and so Cuba's the last socialist nation 
and now even now I think it's changing some, uh, is really the last socialist nation around. It's a very, very difficult thing to do, I think, and I hope I'm wrong, I think it's very difficult in the context of a larger capitalist market where there's competition and some nefarious things here and there can go on, uh, where they're promoting, for example, higher productivity, which means more machines, which means less jobs, um, where you've got broader interests. For example, the U.S. Federal Reserve, as I recall, has usually, at least traditionally, had two mandates. One was to control the money supply, i.e. inflation and so forth. You know what the other one was? Help create full employment. And um, I haven't seen that many signs of creating full employment in the U.S. from the U.S. Federal Reserve banking system. Now, it's got other, other functions now. Uh, but looking at that side of the world uh, doesn't seem to always reach light. Um, This is somewhat more of a comment uh, to the last person's question, sir. Um, is uh, basically just that there is, I mean, I am I am aware of of a uh, large and pretty fabulous um, history of Latin American cooperatives, particularly in Argentina and um, uh, Brazil. Um, I'm not as familiar with Colombia. Um, there's a lot uh, that I know of going on right now, particularly in the cooperatives and particularly, I mean, over time. Yeah. Um, so I, I just wanted to mention that, that that is yeah. something, I know that it, it is difficult. It also is something that's happening in the United States. Um, oh, yeah. All over the place. There's cooperatives in New York. My sister is part of a thriving cooperative system in, in California. Yeah. In Minneapolis, actually. Minneapolis is like the big cooperative like one of the hubs of cooperatives, I feel like, in the US in terms of like people trying to start. So I mean, I guess I'm just saying that I agree that it is difficult. Um, there are a lot of examples and I feel like yeah. actually um, like the factories in Argentina are kind of uh, yeah. pinnacle to people's understanding yeah. overall. Mondragon in Spain. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, I just want to say that there's, even yeah. though I think it's difficult, there are a lot of shining examples. Uh, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, and I, so I guess just to state that, but then also to say that there are also a lot of innovations happening in regards to that of different ways of funding working worlds in New York as a new group that's talking about how to be supportive in regards to innovating the kind of problems that you're talking about. Um, so I guess I was wondering, because when I think about, um, did you, and this is kind of a funny question, I feel like I've been reading a lot of things lately. You wrote an article called Vital Energy, is that true? Vital. Yeah, that yes. I was so some I've of that, that strength. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. I read that. Yeah. And when I was reading it, I was thinking about a lot about, um, about worker cooperatives. And you're talking about like if the big idea is to get people to understand that they um, are necessary for each other. Um, I was curious if you actually, and before this question came up, if you have been involved in any kind of broader. Um, kind of uh, uh, taking that kind of idea of the house economy and, and putting it into Western society and what the house economy in Western society looks like and how, it, how potentially that kind of um, public education or reevaluation yeah. of value in regards to a worker cooperative right. framework has looked. So I guess I'm, I'm guessing that maybe that's a, a silly question given no. your, last, yeah. your, your last answer, but that was going yeah. to be my question. So I, was I have not, it. well, two, two parts of the answer now, answer quickly. No, I've not been very much involved throughout. I'm so trying to figure things out. I've not been that involved in practical work. I am trying to write a more um, public kind of book precisely about these issues. Hopefully, that's another part of the another part of the story, so that instead of being just in the academies, it'd be in language that people can understand, um, with examples like this or others. Uh, but no, I've not, yeah. May I? W I, I think probably uh, <coughs> Jesse's enthusiasm and the um, amazingly articulate and excited crowd here are the answer to my question which is um, about motivation. So I was very interested in uh, 
your conversation about making do mm, and mm, art mm -hmm. and innovation. Yeah. And um, you know, thinking about how necessity does make you put things together and <laughs> reuse things yeah. and call your friends and ask for help in all these different ways. And how as an anthropologist you can value that, um, but when you're, say, a poor artist and you're trying to get something done and somebody asks you, what do you need? You know, a lot of times the answer is actually money. <laughs> <laughs> right. So once you have that money, you're not doing the thing that you were doing before you had the money. <laughs> That's the dialectics of it. Yeah. So, you know, so what would make a person choose to limit themselves when they do get what they, you know, what they think they want? You know, how do you limit the, uh, the human uh, tendency toward wanting more and more? Well, that, yeah. So then I, you know, then yeah. I hear everyone mm -hmm. talking mm -hmm. about how wonderful it is yeah. to cooperate, and I, I, I think that's part of the answer. But maybe you have some. Well, I think I mean there, it's the U.S. is a particular kind of culture. I mean, if you look, and it's changing a bit, but if you look at European countries, and I'm not talking about necessarily the 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 socialist, the prior socialist ones, there's always been more of a social contract. Um, in them, and I think to some degree, than in the U.S. It was really, I've lived in a number of Sweden, Germany, England, and elsewhere, I mean, for some periods of time. And I, it is changing, but the commitments there to more of a welfare state, as it would call, be called, are, are higher. So some of this is, you know, anthropologists call it cultural. Some of it's obviously historical from the past, um, and some of it is resistance to things that have happened in the past and so forth. How you create that kind of change of mentality um, where people feel somewhat more responsible for others, and I could give a lot of different little examples, um, is a fascinating question. You have to bring it into our educational system, good luck. Um, I'm obviously fairly cynical about this. Uh, I think we represent an extreme form of Amer American individualism. And um, how we got there, you know, historians have written about this, you know, to a great extent. You're asking, in a sense, how do you begin to curb the individualistic profit motive and share with others? And uh, so, I mean, I've been fascinated by all the stories that come out these days about the kind of salaries people walk off with. None of us know what you would do with that amount of money. So why do they want it? And um, I haven't really seen, I see economists write about it. I haven't seen anthropologists write about it. And I haven't seen psychologists write about it. And so, you have. Uh, oh. and yeah. And, uh, you know, some of this would be in the realm of what we call social psychology, social psychology and social pressure, but that isn't going to answer it. And um, how, how you transform that and turn some of these energy. I, I was always fascinated. Obviously, it didn't work. I remember in Russia when it was, you know, more of a whatever socialist, communist state, whatever you want to call it, where they would give out, you know, the order of this and the order of that and stuff. And, of course, that's partly what I think Che Guevara was trying to achieve. It didn't work, I guess, but getting people more social recognition. Um, and that's, that's I mean, it's a very, it's all very odd. Here's someone like Steve Jobs, who really was, I guess, an innovator. Um, and highly competitive, but I don't know that he just was looking to make money. So what is it that impels some of these people? Edison, for example, um, maybe it's a mix of both. I haven't, I haven't seen the answers. We need to, we need to work on this. I think. Um, so, I really, um, the way that you answered the question of why why you were down there doing what you were doing really resonates with me. Um, you said that you were not here to give them aid. You're here to learn from them, write about them in your own country so that people will care yeah. about them. Yeah. Um, I would love to hear you elaborate on that because that seems like a very clear defining mission. And, you know, I, 
Well, I mean, I write books and I take up, I mean, I've developed the notion a little, I mean, you heard a little bit with strength. Instead of looking at, I started out by looking, if I work for you, the days of labor I work for you, the days of labor you work for me, and yeah, that's one way. I look at, try to look at people's models, which is a respect for them, uh, and I use the word model purposely because economists are always modeling, so mine's a kind of the flip side of it, which is to say they've got models too. You, I try to bring out their discourse and their practices and see what, what is inside of them. Now, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, to be honest, I don't think it's been done really in economic anthropology before. And so that's one way of giving them respect. For, it doesn't mean I have to agree with it. I don't know what strength is. It is closely related to our notion of energy. Um, and almost our notion of, I mentioned in this piece, it was uh, our, no, our notion of entropy. Um, but you're trying to at least display. Now, the problem is there's this one here, local model, there's this one here, there's this one here. How do you put them together for people? And how does it make sense for people? So I've been constantly just trying to figure out what people are really doing, and it's really tough. Um, and just to follow up what you're talking about, one of the experiences, I can't recall, it might be in what was circulated here or, not, or elsewhere. Um, my co colleague and I, Alberto Rivera, uh, in Colombia, we were up, this was about halfway through field work, and we had a car at that point, and we're driving a man who just wanted a ride out in the countryside from here to there. And um, uh, he, we were talking to him, and then by this time we had different kind of questions that we would ask, and we knew what, you know, it was a conversation. And we're letting him out, and he turned to us, and <laughs> I was, I think, great compliment, I think. He said, it's so interesting to talk to intellectuals like you who understand. And he meant we knew his language. And I thought, my goodness, you know, he's calling us intellectuals on the one hand and saying that we understood him on the other. That's a wonderful verification for what you've done. Um, I don't know why more people don't do it. I don't know why more, I think now with the crisis, more people have gotten away from formal economics. It's colonized our minds. I'm pretty extreme on that, obviously, and I admit, but it's trying to get the message across where the world is open. You go out and you try to figure out, you know, what are people in small businesses doing? And what's their vision of it? And it doesn't mean that they don't have it right because they haven't got the accounting right or they don't have all the words right. List to them and see what they're saying. And of course you're going to find out in family businesses, which are complicated measures, that there's a variety of motivations going on. And they're trying to balance these things, I suspect, a lot. Thank you so much for coming. My pleasure. <laughs>
and uh, well, I won't go on. I've gone around barter clubs in Minneapolis and so forth. Yeah, I think we're actually past time, but I thought uh, I forgot to say that there's a reading group that's trying to form around some of these readings, and then we'll actually get to talk to each other more as a group. So it's this Saturday from four to six at IBEAM. If you want to talk about these things in a group, it's uh, 540 West 21st Street. Um, and I also thought it'd be good if anyone has an event related to these things in the next two weeks. I know you have one for Solidarity NYC. There's uh, the Deep Listening Project. Isn't that on the 13th? It's on the 19th. 19th. Okay. So Solidarity NYC is the group in New York that's documenting all of these Good. local practices, Terrific. and it's through participants, not just yeah. um, from the outside. But are there other events people are doing? I'm not sure exactly when this is happening, but um, the, the Days of Reading is going to be doing a talk at the end of the Barber Club Festival in the Midwest for the Reading Group. It's being coordinated and put on by the Reading Group for the Reading Group. Are there other events that people want everyone here to know about? No. Okay. Yeah.